You're shopping for a bike, and the friendly salesperson offers you to test the prototype for a new model using new technology straight out of space. It turns out you're already using some interstellar inventions on a daily basis. Regular inflatable rubber tires can't do so well on the perilous rocky and sandy terrains of the Moon or Mars. Curiosity Mars rover got some damage to its treads just 16 months into its mission. That's why airless tires relying on a mix of nickel and titanium were invented for NASA rovers. The material is flexible thanks to its tight molecular structure and can return to its original shape every time it deforms. The same airless technology should work great with bike tires down on Earth. The tires are tube-shaped and squash down whenever you roll over a bump. They will develop perfect shape memory over time. They're supposed to work best on gravel, trail, and mountain bikes. When it wears off eventually, the company plans to retread the tires to get the bike back on the trail and to make it last for years. The previous airless tire models were made of patented foam, supposed to last for up to 5,000 miles. They didn't take off because they made the bike too heavy. The new model is supposed to solve that problem and give the world innovative, lightweight, and durable tires. The same tech can be used in an all-terrain car and truck tires high-performance sports, commercial aircraft, and even search and rescue missions. You gotta thank NASA for that comfy memory foam mattress you're using every night. Back in 1966, the original idea behind memory foam was to customize seats for astronauts to somehow ease the effects of G-force on takeoff and landing. It would be too impractical to create a custom seat for every flight, so memory foam became a perfect solution. It easily adjusted to an astronaut's body shape and went back into a rest state when not in use. Memory foam became available to the general public in the early 1980s and is now used in products from mattresses and pillows to amusement park rides, horseback saddles, and football helmet liners. Lenses used to be made of ground and polished glass. In 1972, a new regulation made their manufacturers turn to plastic to make them shatter-resistant. The new lenses were too prone to scratching, so NASA's invention of a diamond hard coating for astronaut helmets and other plastic aerospace equipment came in handy. The new tech was further developed and used for the production of scratch-resistant plastics. It's now used in most sunglasses, prescription lenses, and safety lenses in the US and around the world. The next time you clean your car's interior with a dust buster, remember, you gotta thank NASA and their Apollo space mission for it. They wanted to come up with some portable self-contained drill to extract samples from below the moon's surface. They developed a computer program to produce optimal motor power and minimize power consumption. This program was later adapted and used to create a whole series of useful battery-powered home devices. The most famous of them was the cordless miniature vacuum cleaner under the original name of Dust Buster. In case you didn't trust the name, space blankets are indeed a product of NASA research. They're lightweight, usually gold or silver in color, and capable of reflecting up to 97% of radiated heat. That's just what you need to reduce heat loss from the body and stay warm and comfy in space. The material was originally designed for the exterior surfaces of spacecraft. Now you can see marathon runners at the end of the race wrapping themselves in those blankets to regulate body temperature. It normally drops right after you stop running. Another NASA invention is insulation called Radiant Barrier, made from aluminized polyester. It was designed to survive in wildly cold space temperatures and is now used in most home insulation. Freeze-drying tech for food was not created but greatly improved by NASA to pack more snacks on long Apollo missions. The idea is to cook food, then freeze it under low pressure, and then slowly heat it in a vacuum chamber to remove ice crystals. To bring it back to normal, you just have to add water. Thanks to this tech, food maintains 98% of its nutritional value with only 20% of its original weight. It's a great help for backpackers, disaster relief programs, and anyone who needs to pack light and still get proper nutrition. The infrared thermometer that lets us check temperature from a distance was developed with the support of NASA as well. It measures thermal radiation emitted by your eardrum a lot like they measure the temperature of stars and planets. Each device has a lens that focuses light from the object onto a special detector that converts radiation into an electrical signal and then into temperature you can see on a display. 
It's used for many purposes, from monitoring hotspot temperatures in mechanical and electrical systems to checking the temperature of visitors in public spaces. In the early 1960s, headsets for airline pilots used to be really bulky. They often used handheld mics to communicate. NASA needed a more reliable and lightweight technology for their missions to ensure communication, especially in case of emergencies. They got in touch with the pilots. Just 11 days later, the team came up with a microphone headset unit that could be used by astronauts to communicate with one another and with Earth. The headset was later improved and used for Mercury and Apollo missions. The world was able to hear Neil Armstrong's most famous phrase as he landed on the moon thanks to that wireless headset. You gotta thank NASA for the improved version you use today. The idea behind LED technology dates back to the late 1980s. Back then, NASA was looking for a way to grow plants in space. They tested the tech using wheat and just red LEDs. It wasn't a success at first, but they solved the problem using blue fluorescent lights. The technology was developed and used in many medical devices and everyday items like electricity-saving LED bulbs. These days, they're way more efficient than their ancestors. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Something Neil Armstrong, the first human that set foot on the surface of the moon, said. He was there with Buzz Aldrin, spending two and a half hours on the lunar surface. Preparation for this project took a couple of years, and all the equipment the astronauts carried weighed over 170 pounds. It wasn't easy to land on the moon. There were lots of attempts in history that ended in failure. For example, astronauts in one of the Apollo programs had enough fuel to rocket people to the lunar surface in a mere three days. But they wanted to save on fuel, so it took them over a month to get there. There's no GPS to tell you where exactly to land. The spacecraft travels fast, and it has to slow down in a vacuum with not enough information. But since 1969, 12 people have already walked there. The moon is the only space object humans have visited so far. The rest have only been visited by robots. But all these people were just there for a short visit. NASA announced their program to work on a permanent presence on the moon. That would help scientific research and could be a good point to learn how to do the same on other missions, like the one on Mars. Imagine being the 13th person going to the moon. Scary silence, moon dust under your feet, and nothing but an endless black sky with stars all over you. But you have no time to admire the view. There are many issues you'd need to figure out before landing. First of all, our bodies are like machines that are adapted to conditions on Earth, like gravity, atmosphere, the air we breathe, and the food we eat. Our planet is where we function optimally. Our gravity is six times stronger than on the moon, which is, compared to our planet, almost a vacuum. Whatever you do, it wouldn't be smart to hold your breath in such conditions. The vacuum would pull the air from your body. Oxygen still present in your body would expand together with bodily fluids. They would push against the blood vessels and organ tissues. Your body, legs and arms, they would all lose their current shape and would bloat like a balloon to twice their normal size. If you stayed like that for a longer time, you wouldn't survive. But you wouldn't explode. Your skin is pretty elastic, and it would hold your body together. Liquids that are exposed to your body would evaporate. The surface of your eyes and skin, it would all boil. Saliva would literally boil on your tongue. But the blood would still be liquid. The walls of the vessels would protect it from boiling. No atmosphere, no oxygen either. The oxygen that's already in your lungs would quickly be gone, and you'd have nothing to breathe in. If your organs stopped getting oxygen, usually delivered to different parts of your body by blood, you'd pass out because your brain would shut down. It would happen in the first 15 seconds. That's how much time your body has to use the remaining oxygen in the blood to keep the brain functioning. Stay like that for a longer time, and bye bye No ozone layer, no strong magnetic field, the atmosphere of the moon is similar in density to those uppermost layers of the Earth's atmosphere, where we have the International Space Station. That means your body would be exposed to all those dangerous ionizing radiations from outer space we can't feel now, because layers surrounding Earth keep us safe. On Earth, our muscles and bones are tuned to resist gravitational force. Without gravity, we'd start losing muscles, and our bones would become weaker. 
it's like with the blobfish, a marine creature that looks like the saddest animal on Earth. This fish lives deep down in the ocean. When down there, it looks like most other fish, just slightly scarier. But when it's out in the fresh air, it becomes flat, and its entire body looks like some weird, sad pudding, all due to differences in pressure. The moon would make you look like a blobfish because of drastic changes in atmospheric pressure. There's no pressure that would hold your body together. While on Earth, a column of air presses an approximate mass of 15 to 20 tons on the entire surface of your body. We don't notice this because this air pillar presses the body equally from all sides. There's air inside your body too. Internal pressure is the same as the atmosphere. And on the lunar surface, there's no pressure from outside to back it up. It's also really cold up there. Temperature drastically changes from 250 degrees Fahrenheit during the day to negative 208 degrees Fahrenheit when it's night. A day on the moon lasts 29 Earth days. That means you'd be spending 14 and a half days in unbearable light and the next 14 and a half days in scary cosmic darkness. Your body could eventually freeze solid if it's nighttime, the same as in other places in space. Depending on where exactly you're at, this would happen within 12 to 26 hours. Or if you visited the moon during just one regular afternoon, you'd be burnt to a crisp. It's better to do what Apollo 11 did and come at dawn. The lunar surface isn't so cold yet, and it didn't have enough time to become extremely warm. Even if you survived all this, there are millions of meteor strikes every year. All those small particles of rock or dust that move pretty fast, or even orbiting debris from spacecraft or satellites. A human being wouldn't be able to survive in these conditions for more than one minute. To make it and stay a little bit longer on the moon, the first thing you'd have to take care of is getting protection from radiation. You'd need simulated atmospheric pressure similar to Earth's, and it has to be stable. You'd have to maintain the temperature of your environment so your body doesn't freeze or burn out. Protection from space debris and cosmic dust, breathable oxygen. Oh yeah, you'd also need a communication system, water, food, and maybe some other things that you'd need to function normally. In 1982, NASA started using an extravehicular mobility unit, EMU, for their activities in outer space. The latest Artemis mission has spurred the development of a new generation of spacesuit. The XEMU is an amazing new generation suit that they came up with. You're flying through space, dodging stars and black holes. Your speed is so great that you can get from one galaxy to another in just a few minutes. Sound far-fetched? Well, all this can become a reality because NASA has already tested the technology that might allow us to travel faster than the speed of light. Let's look at the space fleet people have now. To fly into space, we use conventional rockets carrying tons of fuel and oxygen. These two substances get mixed and ignited. Fire bursts out of the rockets. The exhaust gases move downward and the rockets move upward, as if pushing off of them. That's how jet propulsion works. This way, we can make the rocket move at almost five miles per second. At that speed, you could cross the United States from coast to coast in a mere 8.5 minutes. But if we talk about space, that's very slow. A trip to a neighboring planet, like Mars, takes about seven months, and a trip to the edge of the solar system would take about 35 years. That's how long it took the Voyager space probe, launched in 1977, to get there. But we want to travel between stars and galaxies. And the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, is 4.2 light years away from our home. That would take about 73,000 years to get there. That's longer than intelligent human civilization has even existed. And if you wanted to travel across the whole Milky Way galaxy, which is 100,000 light years wide, it would take you about 1.7 trillion years. By comparison, the entire universe is 14 billion years old. People just travel too slowly. But even at the speed of light, it would still take 4.2 years to travel to the nearest star. And you'd spend 2.5 million years to get to the nearby Andromeda galaxy. But we can't accelerate like this. That's because the laws of physics say that an object with mass can't travel at the speed of light. A photon of light has an infinitely small weight. But if you want to accelerate even a tiny grain of sand to that speed, you'd need an infinite amount of energy. Maybe even more than the entire universe has. But 
scientists might have found a way around the laws of physics. To create thrust, you need to push off of something. Ships need water. Planes push off of the air. Rockets use the fuel they burn. But this thing, the M-Drive, works in a different way. A powerful magnetron, like the one in your microwave, sends waves into this cone. It's a resonator. It makes the waves inside bounce off of one of the walls and hit the others. As a result, we have a weak force at the narrow end of the cone and a strong force at the wide end. And if we analyze this powerful force, we'll see that it is directed toward the wide end of the cone. So, the thrust will be in the opposite direction. Now, let's make this model much, much larger and put the M-Drive on a spaceship. The narrow end of the cone faces up. The wide end is turned downward. The magnetron starts to work. The resonator creates thrust and the rocket takes off. It makes no noise and doesn't emit any harmful gases at all. This mechanism can accelerate the rocket much faster than we do with tons of fuel. In theory, we could even reach the speed of light. Sounds great, but in reality, it isn't. Although the inventor of this device tried to prove the M-Drive works, no independent experiment around the world has shown positive results. NASA sponsored the construction of such a machine in a laboratory, but it didn't create any thrust during the research. Another option that would allow us to travel much faster than the speed of light is the Alcubierre bubble. A Mexican scientist has figured out a way to use the general theory of relativity without breaking the laws of physics. Let's say we have a spaceship on a space-time blanket, and it needs to make a trip to the other end of the blanket. Instead of just moving from point A to point B hundreds of thousands of light years away, the ship starts pulling the blanket toward itself. As the spacecraft folds the blanket, point B moves toward it. Now the ship needs to travel a much shorter distance to point B. It makes a quick trip and then straightens the time-space blanket back to normal. Voila! So such a spaceship doesn't need powerful engines that will burn tons of fuel and oxygen. It would move in a kind of bubble. But the hardest part is creating such a bubble. To do this, we would need an amount of energy roughly equal to the mass energy of all of Jupiter. That's more than we can produce on Earth. And still, scientists are planning to test this technology on a small space probe the size of Voyager. But this experiment might last for decades or even centuries. Now scientists are trying to reach at least 20% of the speed of light using a laser. And they're planning to get to Proxima Centauri in about 30 years. It's likely to happen like this. A mothership will launch from Earth. It'll carry thousands of fingernail-sized space probes. After reaching orbit, the mothership will launch the probes into space. Each probe will then deploy a sail, a thin, reflective piece of material the size of a parking lot. Then, people will focus a powerful laser beam from Earth directly onto the probe's sails. This will give them an acceleration 1,000 times as strong as the acceleration of free fall on Earth. One by one, the probes will launch and head for their destination. We won't even have to maintain that laser beam all the time. If you turn off the engines of a regular ship on the water, it'll start to lose speed due to friction with the water. But space is an almost perfect vacuum. There's literally nothing there so there's no friction. All we have to do is accelerate the probes to the needed speed. At 20% of the speed of light, that's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.